Relativity defines how time is the fourth dimension. Get ready to rumble! Albert Einstein versus Niels Bohr! Here in Questions in Physics, we're not here to give simple answers, but instead to ask the hard questions. Today, we're going to ask, what is the importance of philosophy in science? The impact philosophy has upon science is often hidden from common view, but it remains far-reaching into how it affects and even changes our understanding of science. It is perhaps one of the most powerful influences in science, as quite often it's philosophy that governs what we even think science is. First though, a bit of forewarning on the subject. There are some specific concepts that I will be trying to convey in which some of these concepts are lacking in exact definition. So I will be using some terminology in rather loose fashion that may not quite match up exactly to their definition. I will end up using a label as a place marker for a concept. On a personal level, it feels like I'm trying to explain an idea that is a round peg, but the English language only offers square holes. There simply is not an exact fit. The importance in this is that the idea matches up to the label, not to have the definition of the label define and limit the idea. Keep in mind that these are labels and not exact definitions. So for example, I'll be talking about the rationalists, but more specifically the conservative side of rationalism that is used in physics, not the whole of rationalism that might include some things such as questioning the origin of intuitive thought. So I will be focusing specifically to those aspects as to how they will apply to physics. The Philosophical Schools of Thought in Physics Empiricism, the thought that knowledge is derived from experience, that which can be measured is real. Rationalism, the idea that reason can be deduced from experience, that which is most fundamental is real. Axiomatic, reality is based upon primary physical laws which when they are discovered are self-defining to be true. Postulates. Reality is based upon physical laws that are self-evident. However, physical law is not required to be bound to the simplicity of axioms. Realism. The thought that existence in itself is what is real. All theories, models, and explanations are simulations of mechanical law which describes reality. Idealism. Reality is based upon mathematical law, but is not required to be bound to mechanical law. As noted, these explanations do not exactly match up to their textbook definition, but specifically to how they apply to physics. In some cases, the different schools of thought will even overlap. To further explain these concepts, I will use the twin paradox as an example to how these different schools of thought approach this problem. The twin paradox is commonly used to model time dilation as shown in the theory of relativity. In this example, I will be giving four points of reference, A, B, C, and D. Or we could call them Adam, Brittany, Charles, and Debbie. Keep in mind that all schools of thought will agree on the equation. Dilated time equals expected time divided by the square root of 1 minus b squared over c squared. So Adam meets up with Brittany on Earth, and then Adam gets in his spaceship and flies to the star Ross 154 at 75% the speed of light. To keep this simple, Ross 154 just so happens to be approximately about 10 light years from Earth, and 75% of the speed of light can roughly be rounded to 50% time dilation. Brittany stays behind on Earth and uses a powerful telescope to watch Adam on his trip. Like Brittany, Charles and Debbie are also watching from their own vantage point. Charles is halfway between Earth and Ross 154, 
and that distance again off center from the cent from the travel path. Meanwhile, Debbie watches from a planet at Ross 154. All schools of thought agree on the theory of relativity, and all schools of thought agree upon the outcome of the equations. So first, let's do the math. The expected time of arrival is 2 minus 75% times 10 years, which comes out to 12.5 years. This is the time that Charles will measure. However, it will not be measured until 10 years later when the light from both the departure and the arrival reaches his location. However, for Brittany, it takes an additional 10 years for the light of the arrival to reach her location. So she measures 22.5 years. Meanwhile, it takes 10 years before the light departure reaches Debbie, so she me measures a meager 2.5 years for the observed arrival. For Adam, however, his clock is affected by dilation of his velocity and only experiences 6.25 years before he reaches the arrival to the destination. So Adam measures 6.25 years, Brittany measures 22.5 years, Charles measures 12.5 years, and Debbie measures 2.5 years for him to travel 10 light years. Regardless of the conflicts, all of these measurements are actually correct. However, instead, what is debated is the meaning of the end results. What is the very meaning of reality? And so we ask a very simple question. What really happened? Empiricism. The empirical view is that reality is what can be measured. As each observer is in their own inertial frame of reference, each of them experience their own reality. So as there are four observers that can measure the event, there are four answers to this question. Rationalism. The rational view is that which is most fundamental is what is real. The measurement by both Adam and Charles are equally true and valid realities. However, the measurements by Brittany and Debbie are skewed due to propagation delay and have no real relevance on the arrow of time, thus can be discarded as optical illusion, not reality. Axiomatic for the axiomatic view, the equation for the Lorentz transformation formula that describes time dilation is real. Postulates The postulates will argue the fact that Adam experienced time dilation because of velocity is real and can be approximated by equation. Idealism the idealists might avoid the argument altogether, insisting that they provided Adam, Brittany, Charles, and Debbie to be the observers. So all schools of thought agree on the theory, the equation, the math, and the end results, but they all have different ideals of what reality is. So if this is all semantics, why is there any importance of what the different people think is real? If we actually understood all of what the universe is and had every theory worked out to where there was nothing left to discover, then this would only be an argument of semantics. However, under current estimates, we understand at best 5% of what there is to discover. As such, science is not yet static and unchanging, but rather it is constantly evolving. The Philosophy of Understanding for an individual, all of this can be related to how we learn and digest new information. Not everyone learns the same way, and some methods work better than others for different people. Needless to say, an individual is not limited to any one school of thought and may draw upon combination of these ideals. Some people work better with hard data, and these are type minds that drawn more towards the empirical school of thought. 
Others work better with abstract reasoning, to which these minds are drawn more towards the rationalist school of thought. While there are other schools of thought as well, in physics, empiricism and rationalism become the two big twins of reasoning. So, as shown in the twin paradox, how we view the data has a huge impact upon what we consider to be real, what data is of importance. This does not change the fundamental principles of the existing theory, but what about all those theories yet to be discovered? Will the new theory be built upon the axioms of predetermined formulas, or be built upon conceptual information? Historians love to put a single date and name to declare this person did such and such. The reality, though, is many different people work on such projects individually. Some are funded, others as a hobby, and often are battling theories against one another. More often than not, it is not the academic scientist, but instead the amateur with a maverick idea that changes the world. But no one single person does this work alone. So it is all of these schools of thought bring their own uniqueness to the table. Be it through collaboration or battling debates, they work in tandem. When the big two manage to team up together, huge strides typically take place because they have such opposing points of view. Together, they cancel out each other's blind spots. Divided, however, these two schools of thought can have titanic battles between one another. The Politics of Science Here in America, when we think of politics, the first thing that comes to mind are the Democrats and the Republicans. There are, of course, the independent parties such as the Libertarians and the Green Party. In the realm of science, the philosophical schools of thought are the political parties. And just as any other political arena, you have the two big parties of empiricism and rationalism, and the independence of the axiomatic postulates and idealists. Unlike general politics, the empiricists have been in absolute power since the early 1980s. But what kind of power does such a political party actually wield? Foremost, they get to determine what is considered to be accepted in contemporary science, what is to be left in the fringe science. They decide who gets accepted to teach, what theories get to be published as credited materials to learn by, and what projects get to be funded. So just as with any other form of politics, there is big money involved. But the empiricists have not always been the predominant school of thought. Needless to say, as with any other political system, there is muckraking as well. If you do some research, you will find that the label I'm using for the rationalists and my explanation of what rationalism is, you will find it has very little, to, if nothing, to do with the definition of how it is currently described. You have to remember, it is the empiricists that control was accepted information. Imagine if the Republicans were in absolute power for the past quarter century and ask yourself what would the definition of the Democrats look like? This is not to say that the rationalists are not without their faults of their own. This is true. Nonetheless, I will argue that they have been treated unfairly in this matter. How did the empiricists come to power? I mentioned a bit of this in the introductory video. Young, I lived through the end of this political change and can speak of it from first-hand experience. The advent of the atomic age of the 1940s, the press wanted a poster boy to put a face of importance to on this new era, and Einstein was their man. Einstein, of course, used what he called thought experiments, which had their basis in abstract reasoning, which is primarily governed by the rationalist school of thought. So the rationalists became predominant in American science, and throughout the 1950s spread outward to the rest of the world. Empiricism became displaced and sidelined. A footnote on social structure. We have the terms geek and nerd. To most people, these two are synonymous with no difference at all, but very different in the academic field. The nerd faction are very hardcore empiricists, and even when they fell out of favor, they continue to keep to their ideals. 
the geeks were the rationalists and simply do not think in the same manner as the nerds. The nerds are the keepers of knowledge, and the geeks knew that. The geeks needed the nerds for information, and the nerds did not let them forget it. However, the nerds also knew that the geeks had an innate problem-solving ability that they did not seem to have. The geeks embraced the one thing the nerds found downright offensive. Intuition. The geeks were willing to do the one thing the nerds hated most. Guess. To take a guess and then look to see if the guess was correct. To the nerds, this was simply unacceptable. Then we enter the 1960s, which actually began as an innocent ideology of a brave new era. The Cold War continued on, but had done so for so many years already that most felt it was like two paper tigers facing one another. A few big scares of Cuba and the beginning of the Vietnam War in the early years, but the world continued on without any apocalypse. A new generation emerged that was dissatisfied with the status quo brought the many different movements that fought against inequalities. The women's liberation movement, black rights activists, the feminist movement, transcendentalism, American Indian movement, just to name a few. Of rebellious side of the youth and the boomer generation were labeled hippies. Long hair, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and see nothing more than troublemakers. The big turning point for science was the Vietnam Draft that was enacted in 1969. If you were enrolled in college, you were immune to being drafted. Among the nerds, they tended to gravitate towards degrees in quantum mechanics and nuclear physics. The nerds also tended to have a very strict lifestyle, no drugs, very little alcohol, if any at all often wore a tie and a pocket protector, overall very straight-laced. The geeks, on the other hand, tended to gravitate towards degrees in relativity and applied physics. They also blended in well with the hippies, so lots of long hair, playing acoustic guitar in the park, and perhaps some mind-altering substances of dubious legality. By the end of the Vietnam War in 1975, it seemed as if everyone and their brother had either military training or a college degree in science. With all the soldiers returning home, the job market simply did not have room for all the different specialists. However, there were new industries springing up. Specialists in quantum mechanics were needed for the new computer chips being designed. The Cold War was stronger than ever and nuclear power plants were being built for both power and refining weapons grade plutonium so nuclear engineers had plenty of work. Those that studied applied engineering or relativity were simply out of luck. There were not any applications needed for specialists in relativity. Not to mention that they were seen as a load of troublesome hippies anyways. Just simply the way the economy worked out, the empiricists were employed and the rationalists were not. By the 1980s, the empiricists returned to power and it has been that way ever since. So in closing, the current state of affairs has the two big schools of thought battling for power mostly because of economic scarcity. Personally, I find this a sad shame because when they work in tandem, they become such a strong powerhouse. But for the time being, the rationalists are sidelined and even considered degraded. If history tells us anything, it is that nothing lasts forever. One can only wonder what the next philosophical change will look like.